Hello, Cross Camaros Community Church, and this is Pastor Eric Parsons. We are going to be discussing Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. But before we dive in, we're going to pray really quickly. Uh, Father God, we thank you for the time that we have to spend together. We thank you for the technology that allows, allows us to, uh, to be able to share the word. So, Father, right now we just ask that you bless this. We thank you for the, uh, the word that you have given us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So again, Revelation chapter 7. I mean, once you start getting into Revelation chapter 6 and on, uh, the symbolism of the book of Revelation really starts to pick up. And it can be really tempting to do a lot of different things with it that are that is not fitting the nature of the book. Remember, Revelation is an apocalypse. It is uh, very symbolic in nature. Uh, it is um, essentially a revealing. Uh, now, my professor would tell me that, uh, uh, from my most recent class, would tell me that the difference between revel uh, the word revelation and apocalypse is uh, very small, and, that, and, and that's true uh, to the point of being identical. However, what we have to understand is that an, uh, an apocalypse was actually a common form of Jewish writing back in the ancient times. So, while most, most of us think of it as being something in the end times type thing, strictly because of the book of Revelation and perhaps some of the other stuff like from Daniel or Ezekiel, apocalypse just really kind of means a, a revealing of something that's cosmic in nature that from God's perspective. And that's what we need to consider when we start to study this book um, as we continue. Now, my hope is to go backward and uh, do my first couple of lessons also on YouTube so anybody who might kind of jump in in the middle of this isn't kind of lost. So let's go ahead and recap really briefly. We've are, By the time chapter 7 starts, we are in a pause. The first six seals uh, on the scroll have already been opened. Um, we've seen the four horsemen, you know, the one whose rider's na name is Death. We've seen the one that's uh, on the green horse that seems to bring infection and sickness. The, the horse that says, you know, a day's wages for wheat, uh, a, a day's wages for three quarts of barley and all that. And um, so we've already seen all that happen. The seventh seal has not been opened yet, okay? That's very important to understand at this point. But uh, we've already read about the first six seals being opened. One, another really key part of this, and this is why I'm saying it is very important to understand that the script is not, or the scroll is not completely open, is the four horsemen cannot be a part of the final revelation. Back, back in those days, they had scrolls that were sealed, and in this particular case, it was seven seals. These seals guaranteed that the contents were not seen, the book was not open, the book was authentic, okay? So the, they could not have been a part of the final revelation. They simply cannot be because each one was called as the first four seals were opened, you know, with the, one of the creatures saying, come, and then they come out and do their things. They were almost what we could call a pregame show for what is coming. Okay, if you're in the WWE, it would be the dark match. Okay, uh, of particular interest in these seals are the ones who cry out when the fifth seal is opened, asking, when will our blood be avenged? And this is paraphrased. Um, essentially, you know, these are the martyrs that are under the altar at this point and in the heavenly throne room. Okay, remember, all of this stuff is actually happening in the heavenly realm. It is a cosmic revealing, okay? So they're asking, when, is the, uh, when will our blood be avenged? That's an important question to be asked. And then after the sixth seal is open, that's when everybody else living on, on the earth, the kings, the mighty, the rich, the, the, you know, the merchants, even the slaves and everything, they all go and hide under mountains that are crumbling. Everything is leveled. And they're crying out, like, basically, fall on us. Because nobody is, or rather, who is going to be able to stand in the day of the Lord? Now understand that this is a very strong imagery. And, and going back to Revelation chapter 6, if you read that and you start thinking about the application of the church, it is the church that stands. And that is the question that uh, Revelation 7 begins to answer. Okay? So again... Our six seals have been opened. The four horsemen are still outside the actual end of days, okay, so to speak. Uh, in other words, uh, there's a lot more to come. 
uh, of particular interest are, again, are those who are crying out, hey, when are we going to be avenged? These are the martyrs, okay? These are the ones who are killed for their faithfulness to the cross. And after the sixth seal was open, or open, everybody who was still around was asking to be hidden because they knew they couldn't stand. Now, anytime we read Revelation, we must remember that Revelation is a series of symbols. We cannot read this book literally. You just cannot do it, okay? So if we are reading of a an eagle with the face of a man that is not a literal creature uh if we read of uh an armored uh, uh locust with the tail of a scorpion I, we cannot read it literally now there are those who will try to say those are attack helicopters i'm not really to get ready to go that far okay uh now if you were here for the first lesson remember heinrich himmler sat for the portrait of Darth Vader, them and the other SS officers. If you would take a look at a good picture, well, it, such as there is, uh, of Heinrich Himmler, and then a picture of Darth Vader, you're gonna notice some very serious sim um, similarities. And remember, the symbol takes on meaning in its in its context. The original uh, meaning of this, uh, the, the original, yeah, a meaning of the swastika was not as evil as we portray it to be, but it was made evil by the people who chose to use it to perpetrate evil, if that makes sense. So just remember that as Heinrich Himmler was the uh, the model for uh, Darth Vader, there were re very real people that John was using as his inspiration for this, as those who sat for the portrait, to borrow a phrase from my professor. They, they were the basis for the picture that John is creating here. We should also be careful not to try to correlate anything we read directly with something happening today. It is tempting. And if you're on social media, you are seeing it constantly. There's a plague. Therefore, this is the biblical end of days. Reality says that once Jesus came, that started the end times. Okay. So there's really nothing special about this COVID-19 that's anything different from if you look back in the past. It's been really popular to, uh, to compare it to the 1918 flu epidemic. But remember, the Black Death. And, and there have been pandemics throughout the history of mankind. This is nothing new. Just like when we read Matthew 24, when Jesus says there will be wars and rumors of wars and things like that. There has never been a time in human history where that was not a truth. What John is starting to, to communicate here is that there is evil in the world and there is good in the world, but it, evil sometimes is easier to recognize, evil and suffering. That's really the picture that's being painted here. It doesn't do us any good to say, well, he's mentioned this, it must be COVID-19. Not necessarily because somebody else in 1918 might have said, well, it's this Spanish flu or somebody, uh, what was it, 15, 16 years ago, oh, it's the SARS, or you can go the swine flu, or the, the, the avian flu. You, you, you follow where I'm going here. It's not necessarily a direct correlation, okay? So now we're gonna get into the scripture. Revelation chapter seven, verses one through eight. And it's the 144,000 of Israel sealed. I'll save any more comments until we're done. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind could blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to damage earth and sea, saying, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. 
it is really tempting to read too, a little too much into that 144,000. And I want to make a couple of comments on here uh, before we, we even address the 144,000. The four corners of the earth, remember, this is symbolic lit, uh, uh, nomenclature. This is symbolic language. doesn't necessarily mean that we're sitting on a square earth with four angels holding back out, uh, actual wind. We got to kind of get those sort of images out of the mouth. It is hyperbole, okay? So we got angels there that are holding back uh, basically the destruction of the world. And that's important to understand because then the angel comes and says they are going to have the seal of the living God on their foreheads. Remember, as we go on, there are there were certain people that were not able to buy and sell unless it comes much later in Revelation, they wore the mark of the beast. This really is a callback to some of the churches uh, in the messages from Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Uh, I believe it's Thyatira where they were really into guilds and you could not sell unless you were a member of the guild, which meant that you also paid tribute to the emperor. So you could either choose to be marked in the emperor or marked of this world or marked of God. That's really the challenge here for the church, okay? So the seal is really important. The only people that were going to be sealed were the 144,000 faithful. Oh my gosh, does that mean the, uh, that the Lord is going to destroy the other seven plus billion people in the world? Absolutely not. If that were the case, the offer of grace were, was not would not be made to us. This is not a literal number. Remember, we have already said that Revelation cannot be read literally. You just simply cannot do it. It does not make sense that way. Also in previous teachings, we've uh, explained that it's not a linear book. Even though he says after this, all John is saying is that he is just kind of making a demarcation between certain visions. They are all happening pretty much concurrently. Um, my, I'm sure there will be a couple people that might uh, want to correct me. But the important thing is, this is not literal. It is also not a limiting number, okay? It's a strange number, but remember, numbers sort of had a meaning in the Bible, okay? I'm not, I'm not really big into biblical numerology. Like, for example, I'm not going to arrange things on my desk so that they form a seven. No, that, nothing like that, okay? The idea is, is that the Trinity, we all understand that. Uh, but the, the twelves, twelves and tens, my, my professor, Dr. Andy Johnson, I just basically decided to quote him because this is the best way to say it. 144,000 was a number indicating the whole or perfected eschatological people of God. Eschatological does mean end times or in, in that sort of that vein, okay? So it is a whole or perfected number because we must... Uh, what it is, and I'll get to this in a moment, it tens and twelves really had symbolic meaning of completeness, and it did sevens and, and things like that. But we must not make any mistake of what is happening. There is a very real cosmic war happening, even as we speak today. The Bible is filled with this, okay? So this should not shock anybody who has read oh, at least three sentences in the Word. Uh, there is a very real cosmic war happening. The battle lines are being drawn, and they've already been drawn, and this is the Lamb's army. So who are it? Who are the 144,000? Symbolically, okay? We need to understand they are the ones who choose to be marked of God in times when it'd be easier to be more worldly. In other words, it, are, it is those who understand that sometimes being a follower of God means a time of sacrifice. Um, we've already talked about this before. Sometimes laying down your life does not necessarily mean physically laying down your life, but it does mean that there are going to be people that are going to hate you for your choice to follow Christ, right? Rather than go to the bar or to be, you know, to do the worldly things, okay? Or the ones that make a stand for God as opposed to personal comfort and gain by denying him. This is not, it, it, it is not, if this is not a literal number, and we've already discussed it, it is not, it cannot be. Then what does it mean? It is a multiple of both 10 and 12 numbers that are often meant completeness. This number symbolizes completeness or wholeness, as we saw in the quote from Dr. Johnson above. It can either represent the entire church or a subset of the martyrs within the church. There's, there's some... You read one commentator, it says this. You want to read one commentator, it says that. What I will say, it does not mean these are the only ones that are saved. 
That is not true. And I know there are groups that will still purport to say that, okay? We got to understand, this is just a symbolic number of those who will remain in covenant faithfulness to Christ. And that is the decision we have to make, okay? So we should know this is the Lamb's army. The next time this comes up is in Revelation chapter 14, and this starts to fill in the picture, okay? This is still the Lamb and the 144,000 from Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and there was a Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. That very, that very same seal that we were talking about. Now we're going to get to this, but remember in, chap in Revelations chapter 12 and 13, there are people that are marked with the seal, the mark of the beast, which means they are a part of the world, that they care more about their own comfort or their, their idolatry. And idolatry takes many forms. Um, you know, I, I've actually, I've used this a thousand times in our church. I realized that baseball, Major League Baseball and the Pittsburgh Pirates became too important to me when I was choosing to watch the games as opposed to doing my uh, studies that I was called being done. So I had to stop. And actually, I, my fast is still continued. I hardly watch anymore now. I do keep track, don't get me wrong. It's just that it is no longer the obsession that it used to be. That is a form of an, of an idol. Not to the level that they're talking about here, but we got to understand there are many things that can be idols that we still choose to, to do in front of, uh, of, uh, of our calling in Christ. And then it says in verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of a harpist playing on their harps. It's weird language. It's loud, but it's beautiful. Okay? And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. This is Revelation chapter 4 and 5, uh, Isaiah 6. It's also from the throne room in Ezekiel. Remember, all these are they're all consistent with each other. And that, you know, John is borrowing that imagery. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. In other words, those who are marked in God who are going to continue and be a part of his mission, right? It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. I'm going to address this in a minute. These follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That is very important language right there. We must make a decision as the church. Are we going to follow the Lamb? If he says, I'm going here, and we know that following him there leads to persecution, are we going to be faithful to the covenant and follow him? They have been redeemed from humankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found. They are blameless. Now, I do want to point out, this is language that calls back to the Davidic Messiah, to the armies, how they were chosen. Uh, they could not have been defiled. They, 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 were, uh, they abstained from uh, sexual activity and things like that, but they were considered to be ritually pure before they can fight in the army. This is language that John was borrowing from the Old Testament for people that would have known it. It's a very good idea to understand this language. Interpreting all of this stuff with Revelation's help. We can see that that 144,000 from Revelation chapter 7 is the Lamb's army. That's us. If we choose to maintain Old Testament faithfulness. Now, let me back up and put a little asterisk on here. It could mean those that were martyred in Christ, okay? Let's keep that in mind. But still, our call is to the covenant faithfulness. Once again, this is symbolic. They were not literal virgins, but those who were not enticed by the whore of Babylon, which again, we're going to get back get to in a couple of weeks within Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Um, they have maintained their witness remained in Old Testament faithfulness. I don't think it's really the proper language that I, that I really wanted to use there, even under immense persecution. In other words, these are the ones who, when said, choose Christ uh, and choose death, they chose Christ and got death. Think of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, those that were really back, uh, you know, when they knew that a public profession of faith did mean their execution, they still did it, okay? This actually brings us back 
a little bit full circle. One of the first things I talked about whenever we started getting into Revelation was the lamb. The lamb plays an important part of uh, uh, in Revelation. The Sunday school answer, we understand the lamb is Jesus. The description of Jesus, uh, then, you know, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the root of David. These are very warrior-like images for the uh, Messiah. But then I turned and saw a slaughtered lamb. It doesn't make any sense. The word for lamb is our neon in the Greek. Now, I'm not going to hit you over the head with this, but it only occurs one other time in the New Testament, in John 21, 15. And that's where Jesus says to Peter, feed my lambs. He's talking about us. The word for lamb back then was broadly understood. This particular word, not not any word. This particular word, our neon, was broadly understood as one that meant a sacrificial lamb, one that gained victory through its own slaughter. In other words, it, it's sort of like being the U.S. Army and going and saying, we surrender, we win. It doesn't make any sense. But I've said this a thousand times, whenever Jesus quoted uh, Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? While those on the ground started mocking him, what they really should have realized is that he was pointing out that he had obtained the victory by doing the one thing they thought would destroy him. It wasn't a, ma a mark of uh, a surrender. It was checkmate, I have won. This is revealing if we understand that the, uh, the lamb is called, and this is who we're following if we are a part of this 144,000, if it really means the church or if it means the um, those that are martyrs. I'm not, I'm indecis indecisive, but either way, it's still a good ex example. If the lamb is the Arneon and if he gave up his life for those that would, uh, would trust in him, for those that he loved, and we are called the Arneon, this tells us what we need to do if we are going to step up to that responsibility. The overall message of Revelation is a missional one. I want to recommend a book, Holiness and the Missio Dei by Andy Johnson. He's a professor at Nazarene Theological Seminary. In one of the chapters, it talks about holiness and uh, revelation and the mission of God. Vital to our understanding, realistically, of this book. But we understand our mission is to be just like the lamb here in our context. That means sometimes it is self-sacrificing, giving up our rights as we are being forced to do in this time uh, during a pandemic. But I, it's even bigger than that. Giving up our rights in order to advance the cause of the lamb. If that means we are persecuted, so be it. We are persecuted. That is, not, that is the call of a Christian who is following the Lamb. So therefore, I believe that we are called to completely to mimic the behavior. If we are the ones following the Lamb, we must follow so closely that we are copying every move he, is, he does. Okay? There's a, there's a song, Every move I make, I make in you. If you make me move, Jesus. This is that sort of language right here. Even if it would seem to bring us harm. So the lamb-like behavior, I thought Mitchell Reddish captured this perfectly. It's a wonderful uh, uh, commentary on the book of Revelation. It's uh, Smith and Helwes. It is sort of pricey, but it's worth having. But uh, he says on page 145 of the commentary, John has no special rapture theology, whereby the faithful are exempt from the pains and the suffering of the world. In other words, literally, there's no mention of a rapture in the book of Revelation. I'm just going to tell you that. The lamb who conquers is victorious through the path of the sufferings of the world. The way of the lamb is the way of the cross. Those who would be faithful to the lamb cannot expect that their treatment should be any better than his. In other words, we can be saved through persecution. We are not going to be saved from it. But our, old, our covenant faithfulness to Jesus Christ is what actually sustains us through this. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it promise us that we will not suffer. Matter of fact, we can read about the disciples. They were put to death, by and large. Others were exiled we, and they killed in some of the most brutal ways. Early Christians absolutely were. It wasn't until Constantine came to the faith that this largely ended. 
do we have a pattern of widespread persecution? No, it was mostly localized, but that's not the point. If we choose to follow the lamb, that's where that that's what we need to be able to follow him to. So where does this leave us? If we are called to be as the lamb, we do as the lamb does. You know, Jesus said, you know, the demon couldn't be cast out except for by prayer or by fasting. Jesus uh, did in such a way that we are always should be in a mindset of prayer or fasting. That way, the, the Jewish word abad. Now, I don't know much Hebrew, but the reality is, is that it was used both for work and worship. In other words, there was no separation for them between the spiritual and the secular. As we are in the spiritual world, we should be in the world around us. In other words, when people encounter us, they should encounter the Lamb. If we are part of the 144,000, then we are to remain blameless and not surrender to the idols of the world. Does this mean we can't screw up and then we are never a part of it? No, absolutely not. What it means is that we are making the effort to choose the holy rather than the things of this world, the comforts of this world. In other words, we don't bend the Bible's theology. We don't lower the, uh, I love Dr. Rob McCorkle's uh, uh, illustration. If the Bible is up here, we don't bring it down to us to make it easier. No, we elevate ourselves to its level. That's what our call is for. We must remain and uh, maintain covenant faithfulness to the Lamb. It's really that simple. The New Testament is the new covenant. He has bought us with his blood. He has saved us from death through his resurrection. That should be motivation enough to follow him wherever he goes. But he has called us to that level of faithfulness, and this is an illustration of it. We will see in the coming weeks that, in, uh, that our faithfulness does not mean that we fight. So I do want to point out, we may be part of God's army, but we don't go out there swinging a sword. Somebody else does the fighting for us. Understand that Revelation should not be a book that brings us great fear. It should actually put some steel on our spine because we are called to great things in Jesus Christ who has not abandoned us. Remember, in the, in the book, he says, it is done. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end, which means he encompasses everything in, in there. But when we juxtapose all of this with the imagery from the Old Testament, you know, from Daniel 7 and Ezekiel uh, 36 and, uh, and through 39, I believe it is, we understand that we are called to a greater thing. But we are also called to be a part of, of, of God's army, so to speak, that we remain in faithfulness to him. That is the, really the meaning of, of a lot of these passages in the book of Revelation. We are to be in faithful, uh, faithful accord to him, remembering that he comes quickly or he's coming soon, meaning that we don't know necessarily when this time comes. This battle is ongoing in the cosmic realm. We have to understand that, and we are playing a part of that. We, we cannot divorce ourselves from it. We are uh, Christ's bride. But understand that what this should do is create a sense of urgency for us to reach out. As Pastor Jeff has been preaching, we should be out there sowing our good seed. And that good seed should be attractive, attracting people to Jesus Christ and faithfulness. So right now we're going to close. But Father God, we certainly do thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope and encouragement you've given us. We love you. We honor you. And we are so blessed to be a part of your church. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.